Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you and I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you have some community around you to be able to talk through some of these concepts and truths with. If you don't have community like that, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore. You can learn all about it on our website at restoreaustin.org. So click there and get all the information that you need. I hope that we see you soon at one of our gatherings, and I hope that you enjoy this message. Today is the first Sunday in June, uh, which also makes it the first Sunday of Pride Month. Now, if you are familiar with Pride, Pride is a celebration of the dignity and equality of our LGBTQ plus siblings. Now, in the church world, celebrating Pride can sometimes be a little controversial, but I really don't think that it should be. Because you see, the the last place that celebrating the dignity and equality of people made in the image of God, the last place that should be controversial is the church. I want to quote Catholic priest Father James Martin about this because I think he explains it so well. He says, pride is a celebration of the human dignity for a group of people who have been for so long treated like dirt. For the religious person, it is a celebration of them as children of God. It's especially important for churches to celebrate pride because a great deal of the rejection and even violence that the LGBTQ plus community has been through has been motivated by religion, or at least what people think religion teaches. Just because you celebrate pride doesn't mean you have to agree with every video, every article, or even every float in a parade has to say. It's about supporting the fundamental humanity, human rights of this community, the right to live in safety, the right to be treated as equals, and the right to be fully welcomed into society. But you see, for me, there's more to it than the broad pursuit of equality. For me, pride is about my friends, many of whom are a part of the family here at Restore, many of whom are here today. It's about people I deeply love who have been severely marginalized. You see, these friends, my friends, have stories, stories that many of you would not believe, stories of being condemned, being called abominations, being disowned by their families, stories of attempting suicide, stories of violence and abuse through debunked conversion therapy attempts, all at the hands of Christians. I met with one of these friends recently. He told me about being kicked out of his church and his family after coming out. When I asked him what it felt like, he said it felt like everyone I ever loved had abandoned me. It felt like everyone I had ever loved, had abandoned me. See, he's not alone. Issues of isolation and abandonment are especially pronounced among young people, according to the Trevor Project, which is the largest organization in America providing crisis intervention to LGBTQ youth. 42% of LGBTQ youth seriously considered suicide this past year. And acceptance, listen to this one, please. Acceptance from at least one adult can decrease the risk of LGBTQ youth attempting suicide by 40%. 40% if one adult says, I love you, and I'm with you, and you're safe with me. If you're a member of the LGBTQ community, youth or adult here this morning or watching online, I want you to know that you are fully loved, fully accepted, and fully included, not just in this family here at Restore, but in God's family too. But I also know that feeling abandoned or alone or just so tired that you don't think you can keep going transcends sexual orientation, gender identity. It transcends age and race and socioeconomic status and everything else. This has been especially true during the pandemic, right? I don't know if you know this, but Gallup, the kind of world-renowned poll maker, Um, They conducted a poll every year for the last 20 years, asking people to rate their mental health. In 2020, Americans, according to this poll, felt more isolated, alone, depressed, and anxious than in any other year since they started doing the poll. And not just by a little bit, by more than eight percentage points overall, compared to literally any other year. On average, it was more like 20 percentage points. Our Connections pastor, CG, recently went to a mental health in the church conference, and the statistics there were just as staggering. Now, I believe we need to combat this with a myriad of interventions. 
Things like therapy, counseling, exercise, diet, boundaries, and many more things. That's one of the reasons we're offering free counseling through Restore to anyone who needs it. If you want more information about that, come find me after the gathering ends or email me, Zach at RestoreAustin.org. I would love to get you connected to Shannon, who's doing that. But I also believe, I really believe, that Jesus and the church can be incredibly helpful when combating isolation and loneliness. In fact, the very last words out of Jesus' mouth after he resurrected from the grave and before he ascended back into heaven were exactly about this. He anticipated that we would face these struggles. This morning, we're wrapping up our teaching series called Therefore Go. And it's for the last five weeks, we've been breaking down this great commission that Jesus gave to his followers right after the resurrection. Jesus says, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, it's really important to note the timing of this great commission. It was given to the disciples literally just seconds, moments before Jesus ascended, the last time that he was here on earth. But it was also given to the disciples when they were essentially in hiding. They were living in a locked room, afraid for their lives because Jesus has died on the cross just a few days earlier. And they believed that Jesus' killers were probably coming for them next. But after the tomb where Jesus is buried is found empty by Mary Magdalene, Jesus instructs her to run and tell the other disciples that not only is he alive, but he is going to appear to them that very day. He needs to talk to them before he goes. And when Jesus appears, he gives them this great commission. Can you imagine? I just want you to think about it for a second. Can you imagine being in the disciples' shoes in that moment? Just hours before, they thought their best friend and leader was dead, but now he's standing before them and telling them to go and make disciples of all people. I'm sure they were standing in front of Jesus with wide eyes and racing hearts, feeling so incredibly overwhelmed, a a mix of emotions running through them. Scripture tells us that some even doubted when they saw him. They didn't know if he was for real Jesus. They didn't know what he was going to say. They didn't know what he was going to do. They didn't know what was going to come next. And that, y'all, is why I love the last line of the Great Commission so much. The very last words out of Jesus' mouth before he leaves this world are, Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That word, surely, is a term used to remind someone of something. It's Jesus saying, Remember what I told you. Remember what I've always told you that I will always be with you. This sentence out of Jesus' mouth, it would have triggered something in the disciples' memories. They would have remembered the words of Jesus just a few nights before as they ate their last supper together. You see, on the night before Jesus was killed on the cross, he gathered up his disciples for one last meal. And as they ate, Jesus warned them about what was going to happen over the next 24 hours. He tells them, I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be denied. And then I'm going to be killed. And even though it wasn't the first time Jesus had talked about his death, I think the disciples sitting around the table that night, for the first time, it really started to sink in. Like, this is really going to happen. You could see they were in Jerusalem. They, they'd had this triumphal entry. People were shout, shouting Hosanna and laying down their coats and palm branches so Jesus could walk in. They thought he was coming to take care of the Romans, to kick them out, to return Jerusalem to its rightful place of power. That's what they were all about. And then they have this meal together, and Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm going to die. I, I, I can't imagine how anxious they felt, how afraid they felt, how alone they felt. They begin asking questions. They begin making predictions. What's going to happen next? Is it one of us that's going to deny you? Is it one of us that's going to betray you? Their worry and fear are understandable, right? The people that just days before had chanted, Blessed Savior, Hosanna, when they arrived in Jerusalem, will be chanting, Crucify Him, just a few hours later. 
The disciples are afraid because their leader and their friend is about to die and they are going to be left alone, they think, to fend all for themselves. And it's in that moment, at the height of their fear and anxiety about the future, that Jesus makes an incredible promise. It's in John 14, starting in verse 15. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, my Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you, Jesus says, and then he promises the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who is our advocate when we are weak, our peace in the midst of chaos, our comfort when we are wounded, our companion when we feel alone. Then Jesus goes on to not only predict his death and resurrection, he actually predicts the very moment we just read about when the disciples received the Great Commission. Verse 19, he says, Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you will also live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, you are in me, and I am in you. On that day, Jesus said. Well, that day came. For the disciples, when Jesus rose from the grave and appeared to them to give them the great commission. And on that day, Jesus makes good on his promise to never leave them. He reminds his followers that he is with them and that through his Holy Spirit, he will never, ever not be with them. But here's the best part about it, y'all. This promise isn't just for the disciples back then. It's for the disciples today. It's for me and for you God has promised you and me that he is never going to leave us, that he is never going to forsake us, that he is never going to stop relentlessly pursuing us with his love. These promises aren't new. God makes these promises to humanity all throughout the pages of Scripture. Here are some great ones. Genesis 28, 15. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will never leave you. Joshua 1, five. as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 41.10, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. Psalm 23.4, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, because you are close beside me. You may know it as even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And my personal favorite, the promise of God's presence made manifest here on earth. Matthew 1, 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which means God with us. A short time later, that promise came to fruition. Josh, uh, John 1.14 says the word Jesus, that's Jesus became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. This idea of God with us in the flesh, in person, was something new. You see, before the birth of Jesus, God dwelt with humanity primarily in temples and tabernacles. He would appear as the wind or a pillar of fire. But this phrase, made his dwelling among us, literally translates to he tabernacled with us. You see, instead of filling a temple with his presence, God put on flesh and he brought the temple to us. Nothing could be better than that, right? That was the the ultimate, the best. Jesus actually said there was something better. Around the Last Supper table that night with his disciples, he said, in fact, it is best for you that I go away. It's best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the helper won't come. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. And obviously, you wouldn't want to really question Jesus, right? But I bet some of them in that moment, maybe some of you right now are thinking, having the Holy Spirit, it can't really be better than having Jesus, like in the flesh with us, right? And I completely understand. How can anything be better than Emmanuel? God with us. Well, the only thing better than God with us is God in us. Look at what the early church leader Paul tells the church in Corinth. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in 
you. Originally, they went to the temple to experience God. And then God, through Jesus, brought the temple to them. And then God, through the Holy Spirit, we are the temple now. We are the temples now. Through his Holy Spirit, God is with us wherever we go. God in us is even better than God with us. This promise from Jesus comes to fruition through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are never abandoned. We are never alone. I will not leave you, Jesus promises. And he does not, my friends, he does not break his promises. So, I think the question for us becomes, how do we turn this promise into reality in our everyday lives? Because it sounds good here, right? Maybe it even feels good in this room, in this moment. But we, we go from here, right? And we have real life. We have problems and we have broken relationships and we have issues. We have struggles. We have sin. We have pain. How do we make this stick? When we were feeling abandoned, we were feeling alone, like I said earlier, we were feeling just so tired that we can't keep going. How do we experience God in us? Well, thankfully, we don't have to wonder. Jesus tells us in that very same time of teaching the disciples during the Last Supper, he says this, abide in me as I abide in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in them will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now abide in my love. Abide in my love. Did you notice a word there? You can call it out. It's repeated a whole bunch of times. You can call it out. Abide. There we go. Six times in three verses. Jesus tells us to abide in him and in his love. I love this word abide. Now, you may or may not know, but most of the New Testament was originally written in Greek. That was one of the languages kind of common to Jesus' day there in the first century. And this word for abide was used in a variety of ways throughout the Greek language. But my favorite is it was actually used as a term of hospitality. So when a weary traveler was passing through a city, right, barely able to put one foot in front of the other after days of walking, a homeowner in that culture, hospitality is a huge deal. So a homeowner in that culture would walk out, meet the weary traveler and say, abide here tonight. Abide here tonight. The phrase translated in this way literally is stay in the house. Come stay in the house. It was an invitation to rest to regain strength. It was an offer of food and water and friendship. It was an invitation to stop trying to do everything on your own and to abide, even if just for a night, even if just for a moment, in a place where someone else can meet your needs. Most of us have places like that, right? Mine's this little room in our house where our record player is. I just got a new record too. Johnny Cash, live at Austin City Limits. It is very good. I'm not going to lie to you. I bought the last one, though, so you can't have it. That's not true. There's lots. There's on Amazon. Amy and I love to go in there, drink coffee, listen to records, pretend we can't hear the children in the next room. It's great. You probably have a place like that, too, right? Like your garden, maybe, your patio, your favorite coffee shop or restaurant. Maybe yours is outdoors. Mine's not outdoors, and just be honest with you. So I sweat tremendously. I think I covered that earlier, but I'm going to say it again. Maybe yours is outdoors. Maybe it's when you hike. Maybe it's when you experience God in nature. Maybe it's the gym. Again, not mine, but if it's yours, that's fantastic. We abide in these places for a while because they meet a need for us, right? They help give us strength for what's ahead. They, they center us. They give us rest. But the problem with these places, y'all, is that we can't be in them all the time. You have to keep coming back to them over and over again. In fact, you probably start to notice when you haven't abided in your favorite place for a little while, right? You kind of start to feel worn down. I got to get back to the gym. I got to get, I got to, I got to take a walk. I got to just go sit at this restaurant, at this coffee shop and just have a moment. I got to go open a book and read just for a second because it's been too long. 
But the beautiful thing about Jesus being in us is that we don't have to abide in a place, y'all. We get to abide in a person. And Jesus was right. It's so much better. Because places are great, but places are stationary. You can't take them with you. But Jesus abides in us all the time. And we get to choose, moment by moment, whether or not to abide in him. And how do we do that? Well, I don't think abiding in Jesus is necessarily an action, so to speak. There isn't like a 10-step plan I can give you that you can follow for abiding in Christ. Because abiding in Jesus is all about understanding who you are in Christ, how he sees you. It means accepting the truth that you are both fully known and fully loved. I want to say that again because that is a huge deal. That you are both fully known and fully loved by Jesus. And then you live your life from that fullness. Your cup overflows, Scripture says. He's with you. He is in you all the time. I got to tell you a quick story. I got a pretty rough email uh, from a pastor I know on Friday. He, uh, he called me a false teacher. He told me that if I didn't start interpreting the Bible and pastoring people the way he thought I should, um, which really meant telling gay people that they're all going to hell, that I was going to end up in hell too. I'll be honest, my initial reaction did not come from a place of abiding in Jesus. <laughs> How do I know? Well, because I, I include a number of choice words, some people call them expletives, that I'm pretty sure Jesus would not have used. But in that moment, y'all, I felt bitter, I felt angry, and I felt alone. <laughs> I felt alone. But then I remembered that I wasn't alone. And I didn't give in to my initial reaction. I didn't have to give in to my initial reaction. Jesus was with me through the Holy Spirit and through the wise counsel and love of people around me. I took a breath. I prayed. I felt Jesus remind me that this guy's opinion of me has absolutely no bearing on my identity because I am who Jesus says I am. I am not who anyone else says that I am. And I sought some of that wise counsel and I responded in a polite but firm way. And I told him that my salvation and that our church were safely in the hands of Jesus. And that we were going to introduce anyone and everyone to the love of Jesus. No matter what anybody else said. And when I hit send, man, I felt the tangible presence of Jesus with me. I'm not exaggerating at all, y'all. It, like, it was like arms around me. It was a beautiful thing. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. I don't always do this. Sometimes I do the first reaction. Sometimes I react without abiding. And it's because, it's because I try to do it myself, you know? I try to carry all the weight myself. You probably know this, but it doesn't go well. Rarely, rarely does that work. Because here's the thing, choosing not to abide in Jesus makes about as much sense as ignoring the invitation of a hospitable homeowner when you are a weary traveler. It makes about as much sense as collapsing in the street instead of in a warm bed because you are too proud or too self-reliant to admit that you need help. I have found that Jesus is always there always ready to help meet our every need, either directly or by guiding us to someone or something else that can help. But because we are in Christ, we are never alone. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you have been given the Spirit within you, and my friends, you are never alone. Even when it feels like everyone else has abandoned you, Jesus never will. Even when it feels like everything is crumbling down, Jesus is there to pick it back up, to fix the broken pieces. 
He says, I'm always with you to the very end of the age. One of my favorite authors, Rachel Held Evans, says it like this. Should all other identities or securities be thrown into tumult? Should nations be fractured and temples torn down? Amen. (laughs) We're living in it. Should nations be fractured and temples torn down? This truth remains. God is with us and God is for us. It's a story as true now as it has always been. Now, before we wrap up a couple more songs this morning, I want to take us back one more time to that last supper night. Jesus tells his disciples that he's going away, but that he won't leave them as orphans. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to indwell them, and it will actually be better than if Jesus stayed on earth. And do you remember what happens after that? Jesus shares that final meal with his disciples. They call it Passover. Today we call it communion or the Eucharist or Lord's Supper. And that night, Jesus used it to seal his promise that he would always be with his disciples, both then in that moment and forevermore. So this morning, we're going to take communion together and remember that Jesus is always with us and that he will never forsake us. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up, and I'm going to invite our teaching pastor, Ivor Robinson, to come up as well, and she's going to lead us in communion. As they make their way up here, let me pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the love that you pour out, not just once or twice or three times, but over and over and over again. Thank you that we are who you say we are. And that means that we are loved and we are cared for and we are held up as beloved children, your beloved children. Scripture says that you have us in the palm of your hand and nothing can pluck us away. I pray that we would rest in and live from that identity. That we would abide in you through your spirit, even and especially when things are hard. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.